Jerry Coulter, who is the owner um, of Northwoods Bird Dogs, where Makina came from. He's been extremely generous with his time, open with his time, willing to communicate. Um, I think it speaks volumes as to him as a person. Uh, both he and Betsy have been extremely generous. And I f- am honored to be training one of their dogs. This leads you into a conversation with Jerry Coulter, Northwoods Bird Dogs. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I I fully intend on doing more of this, and I I know I enjoyed it. I think you will get a lot out of it too. So thank you guys for your support. Really appreciate it. I think this whole process with me with Makina has been interesting because it's new to me, and I feel like I studied it. You know, dog's a dog. I think, and and a lot of that stuff. It it I don't think it makes nearly the difference that I maybe was afraid of in the beginning, but there, now that I'm getting into it, like I've read some stuff, I've watched some stuff on videos. I've talked with a lot of people. I feel like it's no different. I mean, it's no different than retriever training. Like if you watch three different videos and read three different books, they're all going to have a little bit, they're going to have similarities, but they're going to have differences as well. And I don't know that any of them are wrong or, or any of them are necessarily right. So I'm, I'm, I didn't realize it until doing this with a pointing dog that, you know, it's the same situation. I think like there's a lot of different feelings on process and what comes first and the links of the chain to connect together. So now that I'm literally in it, like I, I, I'm not that good of a student. Like I never, I, I don't, I didn't study that much. I was more of like a real world uh, experience guy. So dog training for me is probably the same. And I, this is, a, this is proving the point again. And, but now it's like, okay, now I'm running into some things where I go, I think there's lots of ways to do it. I'm interested in hearing what your thoughts are on it because this style of dog is, I, I do, I, I've really, I've really realized like the style of dog is unique with the, with this breed. And I think it's with all breeds, but And you've built it. So I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, I want to ask you because you've got, you know, go straight to the source, I guess. So, Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of why I wanted to do this to talk specific on Makina. Um, I am really having a lot of fun with her. She's, she's, it's real, it's real interesting. Um, there's certain things that I just, you know, I can see are in her, like, that boy that that's a pointing dog like that's that picture that like and it's real and they're they're just natural you know they're not there's nothing i'm doing um they're just coming out of her and i'm like god it's really you know that's cool that's the difference it's it is you know there's certain things that are very labrador that i love and like they just have it and they you see it and without me having one all the time i didn't i never really had my hands on one so i never really saw that but um the things like you know I do think that she's really similar in a lot of ways to retrievers like create, like create, like this stuff. This is, and so I, I made a list of notes here and I'm not real formal, but I was like, I really want to explain like, because my one fear is, and I, I get why people call me and ask me questions and they're probably dumb questions. I think, you know, they're, I think they're dumb questions. So they go, well, yeah, well, how do you not know that? Now I have a completely different sympathy for that because this is awkward. This dog was a little awkward to me to begin with. So like, I feel like I'm asking you questions that you're, you may very well be like, it's a really dumb question, really simple answer. Why, why, but you, without knowing it, you don't, you don't know that. So I agree. Yeah. Like her, her, like things like crate training and housebreaking and all that was just very simple, like no different than anything. She, I mean, you, when we picked her up, we take her outside. She goes to the bathroom. I'm going to leave. I put her outside. She goes to the bathroom. I stopped once on the way home. She went to the bathroom. Like I'm not, I've had zero accidents. I've had zero. We've not had an issue. And, and she actually, I think is better at it with the idea of like, she'll come out of her crate. We have her crate close to the front door. We used to have it by the back door, but now we'll have a puppies back there. So we moved her to the front, but like, she'll come out of the crate. She's not even in a hurry to go to the bathroom. She'll hold it till we get her outside to her spot. She goes to her place and and does it. So that's been really easy. Recall has been different. Like she did not have the, 
she did not have the natural tendency to want to be with me when she was really little. Like she was a, she was a, good girl. Um, a good girl. Hey, I, hey, I don't hey, think defiance hey, the right hey, word, but hey, like, hey, 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 come on. She was, she was distanced to me from me. Like she'll come to me, but then she'll stop about hey, four hey, feet hey, from hey, me hey, and look at me and like stare at me and very on. steady and just hey, look hey, at me girl. and yeah. and not hey, like. Dog. Where my dogs, my other dogs would normally like, they can't get close enough to me. They want to climb up on my legs. They want to be on my feet. They want to be all over me. And so I felt like this little bit of cold from her when I, and I was like, God, I got to warm her up. And so I ended up, um, she would always come, but she would never finish. I would always say she never finishes. She never comes to me and lets me pet her. Like I'd reach out to pet her and she'd take it. She'd shift back a little bit. And I'd just be like, so I don't know if she was intimidated by me a little bit, but I ended up one of the best, one of the things I think helped was we got a busy house, like with all our dogs and our kids and our everything, you know, it's pretty fast, yeah. it's relatively fast paced. And so in the evening when everyone went to bed, I, I got in this habit of nightly sitting down on the floor, just kind of laying down on the floor almost with her and letting her like ease into me, ease into me, ease into me. And she really warmed up. And then it, and, and she was almost warm to start out with, with a stranger more than me. And I almost oh. feel like it was a relationship thing with me and her. She probably, mm-hmm. I probably was maybe a little firm to start out with her and not as warm. And then I think it just took, so that was different than what I'm used to. But do you see that with, with these pups? I mean, I don't have the comparison of the labs. Yeah. But just in general, the bird dogs are a little more independent. Yeah. No, I mean, not that they don't want to listen, but they don't quite have that gotta be right next to you. Right. Right. Which is right. which is what you what you want in a lab or a dog that is really working with you. Because one thing about bird dogs is a lot of what they do is just natural. Yeah. It's kind of like if you I look at them sometimes like close working hounds right right i mean because they don't teach the hound a tree they don't teach down i mean you, you, they give them opportunity right right, right. and then they let it all come out you know right. so there's a difference but i'd say that that's probably not uncommon you know especially they'll go through phases i mean a lot of times unless you get one that's super food oriented you know and some of them are like you mentioned that so i got two litter mates and one is a crazy eater. I mean, most of a good share of our setters eat like labs. Yeah. But like of the two I got, one was eating pretty good. And now, and there's nothing wrong with him. He's just not eating that well. And he's kind of, you know, I wish he would eat a little more. Sure. You know, sure. And the other one is just fine. Yeah. He eats how, almost however much you put in a bowl. I feed him twice a day and I give them to 15 minutes, whatever. You know, most of them, they put their head in it and eat until they're done. Sure. Sure. Um, but I would say that that's probably not uncommon what you're saying. Sure. As far as it's not that they don't like you or anything, I don't think. I mean, there might have been something with, like with you and her, but I yeah. mean, as far as in the field, it's not like they don't like you, but they just don't feel this, this big need to be right next to you. Right. And, right. and it is cha- and it has changed. Like we've gone through, like it's, she's, I think she's going to be 18 weeks this coming Sunday. And we've gone through some roller coasters. The recall has been a roller coaster. Like, and I don't know that I, I don't know that that's different than a lab either, because usually I think what it was, was it happened sooner. Like my labs usually recall really well until they're about 12 weeks old, 13 weeks old. And then all of a sudden they decide there's better things to check out than you where Mm -hmm. she right from the start would was okay with being away from me. Like not necessarily coming right to me. Mm-hmm. That was that was frustrating. That was probably by about ten weeks. I mean, mm-hmm. at, at, by the time it wasn't even that. I shouldn't even say that because my mom and dad ended up. I we had to go to this show right away, so my mom and dad had her. We had her for like four or five days, and then they babysat our little one and the puppy. And so they, my dad asked me right away when he comes home. He goes, "Did she come in for you? Like, did she come back into the house for you?" And I'm like you know what? Not very well. And he's like, yeah, I know. Like I had, I put her on a lead because I was afraid she'd run away. And, and my dad's not a dog trainer and he, you know, he, yeah. he's cautious right. about stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. He wanted to be cautious. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and they live way out in the country and stuff. So, but I, I was like, yeah, you know, 
it, it, it has been a little bit of an issue. And so probably about a week of that, where I was just like, I mean, I had to put 15 minutes aside every time to get her back in the house. Cause I had to figure out how to catch her and I didn't want to go get her, you know? So I did use, I don't use food a lot in training, but I did use a little kibble getting her in the door. I'd get her to come into the door. I'd rattle her food in the, in a dish. I'd get her to come through the door. I did it for about three or four days. And then I, 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 I took the food away. I don't think it was, I, I, the food I think was part of it. She was excited about that for a little bit, but like when, once she gets there, she doesn't really want to eat the food. I just think she was kind of excited about the game. Like, and so after about three days, I, I really cut back and not using the food. And it was like a light bulb switched on her turned on and she like she races in the house now she really wants to come in really well so i actually think that the game like turning it into a little bit of a fun thing for her was powerful it was more powerful than the food itself and so forming that habit it's stuck now will we go back i hope not but um i'm really happy with the recall like your recall in in a week we had a probably a two to three week window where it was like what do i do and then, then all of a sudden it, you know, it went real well. So that's, I, I don't, I don't think that it's different. I think it happened earlier than, than it does typically with my dogs, but um, it's good. Uh, you know, obviously distractions anywhere. There's a distraction, you know, that, that we, we have to just be really careful about prepping her for that. But um, one thing that I did with her right away and we messaged about it a little bit was her place training and mm-hmm. I've not had a better one on place. Like, and I've had, and I've had people tell me, and usually our labs are, are really good at that. I mean, they catch on to that really well. The perimeter is easy for them to understand. And I have, I can't tell you how many people messaged me and talked to me ahead of time and said, you'll never get that. You won't get that dog to be able to be on place reliably. And including like Todd and Chris, I mean, they've told me it too, but like, I, I think what happened was, is having, having so many people say it to me, made me be a lot more like I, I was real, I was real focused on it. I, I didn't let the dogs sneak. And where, when I, when I, with some dogs, if I let them take a, you know, if I let them put a foot down next thing, it's two feet and then it's a, and then it's a battle and she's not, she did test uh, for a, a really short window where she lay that little paw down really gently. And I mean, I, she's freaking smart. So I knew she was doing it so that I wouldn't see it. And then I, you know, we catch her and, but she's super reliable on it. And I just think it, it's probably because I was heightened. Like my focus on it was so much more focused Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and she did really, she's done really, really well with it. Um, I started heel work with her um, on lead. And the one thing about her was, she's coming out of it. And this is the, another thing that like, it hasn't been that long with her. And I feel like she gets, she, she gets stuck on stuff. Like she's, a, she's quirky about stuff, but it's for a relatively short window. If you address it right away, like she gets through it quickly, which I was impressed with, mm-hmm. like, and happy with she's, she's, she's soft, you know, she's very, she's very soft. And I, I consider myself pretty soft with her, but mm-hmm. like, she'll get intimidated. Like the dishwasher used to be a big deal to her. Like, I mean, she couldn't, she'd freak out when, and it's not very noisy and it's, but it was different and it really made her panic. And it, she's, we wash the dishes once or twice a day. So she's had to get used to it, you know, and she's settled into it. Vacuum cleaner, same thing. Uh, Vehicles. She's, she's spooky about the sound of a vehicle. I think she thinks they're growling at at her, you know, I think four wheelers and that stuff. She's mm-hmm. real sensitive to that. And oh. so when I started out with heel, if I had to really have her mind clear, because if she had any hesitation of this, these outside things, she literally locked up all four feet and then you weren't moving her. You know, she was, yeah. she just said, I'm, I quit, yeah. Yeah. but, but she's, um, she, she's, she's really, once she gets past it, she's super quick and she just learns very fast and her heel work is really good. And I, I you know, we're, we're making turn, I'm making lots of turns, lefts, right, squares, all sorts of stuff. Her feet are great. Her feet move really well with me. I, she's moving her hind quarters really nice, all sorts of really good stuff there. And so now I want to, want to ask this because typically like, and it's no different than what I, this process is no different steps wise than what I pro- probably would do with my labs. 
but I would start working on like some, some like remote sit type stuff, some steadiness stuff with my labs right now. I'd, I'd get them to sit to stop and I'd, I'd take steps from them and move back to them and not want them to push off from the pressure of me coming back to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I haven't even asked her to sit yet. And the reason I haven't asked her to sit is because people I say, don't teach them to sit. And I don't know if I believe that, but she doesn't move. Like she'll stand and she'll stand nicely. And so I've kind of thought, I don't know what I'm gaining by having her sit just yet. Like as long as she stands still, I think I'm, I prefer it. And so do you think this is a bigger question about like wool and steadiness? I've heard and read and I've seen different people throw all sorts of different ideas out with when and how to start doing wool stuff. And my first thought was my first confusion with it is I always thought wool was connected to birds. And I always thought it was somehow, you know, tied to the idea of be steady on with this point in, in this temptation. And so I read, but I also read some stuff that says, you know, you shouldn't have a bird anywhere near this process. It should be just teach the dog to stop. And so I, I'm in the camp always of like, avoid a bad habit rather than train it out later. And my thought with her is because she's so prone to stand still for me. Am I silly to at this early of an age work on controlled stuff like heel work and then ask her to stand and walk away, take three, four steps away, move back three, four steps. And, and I feel like that's putting pressure on her and I, I want to get, so I'm pretty gentle about getting back mm -hmm. into position, but mm -hmm. is it too early to do something like that? Like, what are your thoughts on wool? Well, let me back up for a minute because I just wrote a blog on this and I can't remember who, 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 who inspired me for it, but I called, it's called getting in a dog's head, which we do every time we train them, yep. right? When you get in a dog's head, you're causing them to do something that's not their idea, right? Sure. And, and certainly for a lot of things, you want to be in their head, right? Everything you do, right? You want them focusing on you. But with bird dogs, it's, it's very different. It's okay to be in their head, all the stuff you're doing. But I think when they're young, and this is maybe the, more the old school, but I've heard up, this is the way I've learned it and done it. And it's worked out very well because there's a big difference with hunting with a point dog. Okay. When you hunt with a point dog and you may think this way about your labs too, and maybe it is, but with the point dog, it's not, it's, I want it to be a partner, right? Right. Not a tool. Totally. People want them to be tools. And so then you micromanage them, right? Yep. Okay. Like, I don't want them to make a mistake here. I don't want them. I can help them along through this and they can learn it faster. Well, they're not really learning it. They're dependent on you. Sure. Right. That's why you get some of these guys that they want to woe train them when they're young and never let them chase a bird. And it's like, you know what? I want them to chase birds. I want them to, you know what? I want them to figure out that that chase now, if it's taken to an extreme, I mean, if months and months and birds and birds later, they're still chasing like crazy, probably something wrong in the genes a little bit, but then maybe you need to help them along, you know, mm -hmm. but I, if they'll chase birds enough and then they'll just start not wanting to chase birds. Cause when they're, when bird dogs are young and this is a hard thing for people to understand it, it really was hard for me now with the German breeds and stuff are different, but I'm talking mostly pointers and setters, what I call pure bird dogs. They were bred to do nothing but birds, fine and point birds. Um, if you get in their head too much, you take away from all that. So, if, but if you let them chase and chase and they eventually stop chasing because you know what becomes a big deal to them? They, when they're young, they're, when dogs are young, the bird dogs, most of them are a little more eye oriented than nose oriented, right? So they'll point the bird, but man, if something flitters up over here or something, they're gone. You know, or if the bird even, flicks a little bit they're gone and they're chasing right sure. well, i've had some point dogs that young puppies even that the bird flies away and they just go and smell right where the bird was like they're very nose oriented but most of them start out more eye oriented and this, that's why you'll see them sight point and flies and they'll sight point this and that because what what turns on a bird dog isn't killing the bird for it it's the smell of a bird that is their cocaine sure so, but when they're young, they got all these other things going on, but that's why they chase less and less. And all of a sudden they start realizing that, 
man, when they're pulling a bird, this feels really good. And that's really what lights them up, which is why you can kill a bird for them and they'll run over and sniff it and they're off gone. Because even a dead bird doesn't smell like a live bird. Sure. You know? And so my point with all that is you got to let these young dogs just learn. That's why I say they're a little bit like a hound. Take them where birds are, take them in the country where birds are, and just let them do what their instincts, she, she, she has good instincts. Let them just do. And it, that's why I say you can't put a timeline on it. You ever listen to the Smiths, Rick Smith, right? The, the, if you ever heard of them, the bird dog trainers, right? Del Mar's son and all that. He's, he always says, people ask him, how long does it take to train your point dog? He said, it takes as long as it takes. Sure. And I'm not even saying it's going to be years, but there's a period between, let's say, any time now with your dog and the next hunting season where they're going to go through a lot of different phases. You're going to see them at first. This is why at first, all these puppies we have, they're going to smell a bird and they're probably going to point it in the first few times, right? Because as much as it might seem innate that they should want to go grab it, most of them don't. They're, they smell that bird and they're not quite sure what it is, but their instincts say, don't move, Yeah, you know? And then what's going to happen is they're going to get a little bolder and then they're going to move a little bit more. And then they might even not even stop and point for a while because they get really excited. But that's great. They're getting all that enthusiasm. They're getting fired up. You, I mean, they got to go through shit to find these birds and you want right. them excited and have a desire to keep finding the birds. Right. Then they're going to come back and start pointing them again. And that's the time you really can move on. Okay. You really want them to go through a point, a, a, a bump and chase stage. And then when they come back, to point and they'll have figured this is where you got it. They'll tell you, that's what the old boys used to say in all the old books. And I got a jillium. The dog will tell you when he's ready to be broke. And that time they mean shedded up, whatever. Right. Yeah. And that's what they mean. The dog, when the dog starts standing long enough for you to get to it. Now, not when it's six months old, because most of them will do that. Sure. And that's what a lot of people, they'll train these dogs young. And I saw it a lot in Georgia and they'll steady them up and put that pressure on young. And you can get by with that, but it's not what the dog wants. Right. And for a short term gain of, let's say, another few months, because even when I say all this, you're going to take her next fall. And without doing any, when I was a helper on, on birds, right? She's going to point some. You can shoot, you know? Right. But right. so you can let think, them learn. So if you take away, like, so, and I, I, I hear that and I get, I totally agree what are your thoughts about the idea of like, so what is wool to you is wool? What is wool? What is wool training to you? To me, it's a, you know, and I, I, I kind of waffle back and forth on this a little, but I strictly use birds when I'm training it. Okay. I mean, I, I've done it all different ways. I've tried every way there has been. Right. Um, I use birds and to me, I only use it around birds. Okay. okay? Now, like you said, there's no 100% in everything. The only other place I ever use it in Georgia, and I and I actually, there's only two places I use it. I use it on a bird, and when I'm working dogs, I always woe them right before I turn them loose, right? So like if I'm working two dogs, or like in Georgia, I'd woe the dog, and then I'd get up on the horse, or both the dogs, and then when I get all set in the horse, I say, all right, and off they go. Yep. So I start out, and... I start, and they're always excited then. So when I woke them then, I mean, by that horse, I mean, they're, they're just looking straight ahead. Like we're excited. Like you say, your dog just standing there and they're looking good and off they go. And then I only use woe around birds, but I know people use it for everything. It's like, I, I just use it around birds. Okay. I mean, they say, what if you want them to stop somewhere? I don't know. I've been doing this for a long, long time. Like, I don't have that many reasons that I want them to stop <laughs> except sure. around a bird. Sure. You know, and that might only be, and when I woe a dog, I will never woe them until they've made the mistake. When I woe them, eventually I'll let them bump the bird. Cause from, for me, from the time they smell that bird until the time they either get it pointed or put it in the air, that's their business. Right. I don't know. Easy, careful, blah, nothing, nothing. You know, I'm not saying a word, Sure, but when he gets to the point where they know whoa and they understand it, if they bump it, then I woe them. Okay. And say, no, you shouldn't have done that. In other words, there's a little negative, but I'm not helping them do it right, but I'm showing them the boundary of what's sure. acceptable. Sure. So, and that, that makes sense. And it's part of why it's part of why, and 
so uh, don't judge me by my thinking process here. But like, so my thought with it reasoning was because I don't, so like I see a lot of, in, in I draw these connections to retriever stuff. Like yeah. I see guys get, I see guys get retrievers so amped up about the retrieve early on that they, they then go steady. And they, and I, I know a lot of, a lot of them, and, and I'm, again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but a lot of them say, don't worry about steadiness with your retriever, get them to love the retrieve, get, build that drive, build that drive, build that drive. And then, and they do that. And then in order to get steadiness out of them, they really have to get on them. Like they have to, because they've built this fire so hot, they have to really douse it. They can't just turn the heat down you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. Like I don't, I, I'm a believer in, um, I don't put that much pressure on the dog. So like, I, I don't want to have to, and I, and my, my feeling is, is if I don't get the fire blazing out of control, then I don't have to be dramatic and extreme on the other end to knock them back down. And mm -hmm. so my, my thought with the idea of, if I get the dog responding to the idea of just stop, you know, like in, instead of using the word, whoa, because I feel like every time I say, whoa, I think birds, you know, I think dog, I see the guy, whoa, whoa, yeah. you know, right. the, the, the dog's going to move on the bird and whoa, whoa. Right. So that's the, that's what I envision. That's what I think of from a training standpoint. Mm -hmm. My thought is like with, with her, with Makina, you know, she's, she does have a tendency right now to, when she's moving, she's moving. When she's not moving, she's standing still. And mm -hmm. so she's doing it really naturally for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at that and going, should I foster that? Like, should I, should I foster the idea of when you move, move, like do your thing. When you want to stop and stand still, I want to associate, I want you to connect that with, I want you to stand there for mm -hmm. a little bit. And mm -hmm. would it, would it make my life easier when it comes to, and, and like, so, so when it comes, when you were talking about the idea of like, letting them chase the bird and all that. I totally, I am a hundred percent on board with the idea of like, they, I don't think, first off, I don't think I'm a strong enough. I don't have enough experience training these dogs to time it. Well, I don't think I can get in the way of nature. Like I think I would, I think I just confuse more than anything. I think that's something that they can figure out mm -hmm. run. It's, it's just a lot of running, come back, get another one, that kind of thing. But I also am, am trying to think like, would it make that less of a, would it make that phase maybe shorter or less easier or smoother if I get them to understand away from a bird that go or, or stop, go or stop and, and be able to almost control it a little bit. And so now I'm questioning myself because I'm going, I don't want to, I don't want to take away from the dog's natural either and that's where that's where like I, i've heard a lot of retriever people tell me you know you you can't do what you're doing because you'll you'll take that fire out of them and i i look at them and i i and who i hear it from is the guys that have the hottest fucking dogs in the first place like they have they have dogs that are on fire dragging eating i mean just fire breathing i want i want anything to do with them right. my dogs are pretty relaxed by right. nature right. intentionally Right. And so, and, and the way I hunt them and the things I do with them now, I'm not field trialing them. So I'll be the first right. person to say, like, I'm not going to go win AKC field trials with them, right. but I hunt them and I'm, i I'm, I consider myself a fairly average house pet dog owner type thing with them. As far as hunting and family goes, we do it all. And I look at it and I go, those dog, my dogs, even my flattest dogs, are, are, have more go in the field than most people are ever going to need average mm -hmm. people, you know, not mm -hmm. field trial guys, but average people. Mm -hmm. So I just look at it and I, I'm just thinking about it and going, I've not, I've never had like, and I think that's partly their breeding. Like they're, she's bred to, my dogs are bred to retrieve, but they're also bred to be pretty quiet and pretty, you know, pretty nice temperament. And I look at her, I look at Makina and I go, is it in her breeding right now where she is when she goes, she goes. And when she stops, she stops. And should I try to like, should I try to 
massage both of them at the same time to make well, my life easier down the road. I mean, if, as long as you don't associate it with birds, okay? Yeah. That's an option too. I mean, if she just stops and stands there really good, I mean, you can just say, whoa, right? And overlay right. it and start it. There's nothing wrong with that because you're really not putting pressure on her. She's doing it anyhow. Right. Yeah, right. there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I do that a lot with my dogs. I mean, partly the way I give you a little nickel, the way I do whoa is I, I work with their natural instincts. So I've got the bird field behind the kennel and I put pigeons out there when they're young, okay? Yep. Like a dog these age, five, six months, whatever. And we just let them go. We got pigeons in launchers and they point them and we shoot some and let them chase the others, whatever, right? Well, they get to learn that that field has birds in it, right? Well, then I start planting a bird in the same. Now let's say they're a few months older, maybe even they're eight months, 10 months, 12 months older. Maybe they went through hunting season, okay? Now I start putting a pigeon in the same spot, okay? Yep. Right outside the gate. I call this technical training. And that dog starts to figure out not too, and it doesn't take too long. Right. But as soon as they get to that gate, even though they're not, I, not where they can smell it, I just put a bird there and bring them out and pop it. Okay, maybe it's 20 yards out, 30 yards out. And it doesn't take long and they come to that gate and they stop and point, okay? Because they know there's a bird out there, even though they can't smell it or anything, but it's been there every time, sure. right? Then I start saying, just kind of what you're saying. I start saying, actually, I don't say, whoa, at that point, I, I have the collar on their flank. And at first I don't use any stimulation, although I got it, I use very, very low in stimulation, but I just lift up on it, okay? I don't really say anything at the, you can. Okay, I've done this many different ways. You can say, whoa, now, same thing. They're doing it already. I'm just gonna put a word on it and I'm gonna teach them that, that, that stimulation on the flank, but people don't get is it doesn't just mean stop. It means there's a bird around. Sure. It's like you're communicating. I mean, it's very low. I use this um, e-collar technologies and it's got a dial that goes from zero to a hundred by ones. Sure. Right? And it's, you know, I don't know. I can't even feel it at 30, you know, but I put dogs can, on their, especially on their flank. So anyways, I go through all that and I slowly, then I start stimulating them real low on the flank, like maybe two or three. So they don't even, they really don't even acknowledge it, but they're getting stimulation you know, I'm stroking them. They're saying, well, they have the instinct to stand there now, you know, then I'll just pop the bird. Right. Yeah. And at first I'll let them, I'll have them on a check cord at this point. Now I'll let them chase a little ways and then I'll just stop. Them, right. And I might, I won't even stop them with the flank collar. If I can, if I can work up the rope and pull the point of contact I'm trying to make is that flank. Yeah. That means there's a bird around and stop. You're stopping anyhow, but I, I I'll do that. Then I'll move. I'll put several birds out, but always in the same spot for a while. And do, just go through that every time, every time, every time, right? And it won't take long. And then I'll start, I'll start doing things to make them move a little bit. Or if they want to start creeping up a little bit, I'll, I'll hold the button down and stimulate them and then stop them by helping the collar, you know, and slowly get them to understand. I haven't really said a word yet. You could say, whoa, and I've done it both ways. I've said, whoa, I've said, whoa. Most of the time, I don't say the word until they are actually, you can stop them with the collar. Because same thing, once you get a behavior, to put a word on it right. is not as simple. Right. And the other thing I found out with some dogs, now not, that's why you want to build that fire. With some dogs, if you start putting a little pressure on them like that and you say something to them, all of a sudden they're looking back. I don't want them ever looking back. If, sure. you're, if there's a bird there, I want them totally focused on that bird. And that's why I try not to say anything around birds. Sure. Now, our, a lot of dogs you could, and most our dogs have a lot of intensity and desire you could too, but I've trained a lot of softer dogs. And the thing with this method is this works with the softest dog there is, and it works with the toughest dog there is. Yeah. But it has to be a dog that has enough instinct to want to stop. Right. right. Which, is, which is probably why I'm thinking this internally of like, I love what I'm seeing. Like I'm looking at this and I'm going, damn, she does it on her own. So mm -hmm. why, so my thought, my mentality is capture it when I can. And my yeah. fear with it is, is shouldn't I, you know, and I'm looking at it and, and, and totally like, totally my thought with it is almost like I need to change my mindset of under, of the thought process of, whoa, and maybe, maybe it's easier for me to like do it, to say, okay, instead of calling it whoa training, 
start call, in your mind, think of it as stopping training, like stop, mm-hmm. stand still training, like mm-hmm. stand still. It's remote sit. This is the, this is what I've been referring to it with like Chris yeah. Smith and Todd and those guys. When I talk with them, I'm like, it's like a remote sit for, yeah. for our dogs. Yeah. Like I, I, it's just don't do anything else. Stay yeah. right there, you know, sitting yeah. for our dogs, yeah. but yeah. don't do anything else. And my, because the, because she's doing it, like, she's doing it really well. And I, and I've asked myself multiple times a question, like, I haven't even questioned it. I've just kind of said, ah, there's, there it is. Because like, I took a picture of her the the other day, and I think I posted it actually on Instagram, but she's on her bed. And my wife came home and came through the front door and all my other dogs are, are moving about the house. Well, she's on her place. And so she got up, she came to attention She walked to the edge and she's literally just like a statue, beautiful tail, perfect, everything. And I, and she'll do that whether she's on her bed or a lot of times she'll do it on the ground and she'll come to something interesting and she'll literally stand Mm -hmm. and it's like picturesque, like it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I go, there's the pointer, you know, like in my mind, I'm going, man, that's that. And I'm thinking a hundred percent genetics you know i'm going that dog is built to do that where she does and i can read this in her body when it's only when she's comfortable because if she's not comfortable she's a tail tucker she'll tell me everything i need to know in that tail and Mm -hmm. she she lays it down she'll she and she can go from you know these feelings of uncomfortableness and little fear and a little timidness and and i and i know she's not capable she's not going to learn anything in that moment and then all of a sudden we I, i figure out you know, what do I have to do to get her comfortable? And then the indicator with her is her tail because it goes back to looking like a setter and she carries it. And when she carries it like that, I know she's, I know she's stuff is soaking into her. I feel like it's sticking. And so my, my big thing with her and a lot of our, we've been filming a lot of these sessions with her and like, I keep kind of talking about it so that people understand what I'm thinking in my head, but I keep looking at that tail as this indicator and this to me i'm seeing so much steadiness in this little puppy to begin with and i'm i don't want to um i'm fearful because of what i've heard and thought on one hand and then i'm also going but i really believe in like if she's doing it right let her do it right regardless of her age necessarily like she hasn't seen a bird yet she's not she's not she doesn't we're not doing bird stuff with her so like i'm totally separating this yeah that's fine yeah. I mean, that, that's not, I don't see any problem with that. Okay. So I'm going to, I, I, I want to, I, and I, I'm going to like one of my incremental things with healing with her is I'm going to like, I'm going to start working on just have you stand and I'm going to walk away from you. Cause I always feel like with my dogs, we develop, they develop this comfort next to me, which she's getting like before it wasn't now it is. And mm-hmm. she's comfortable next to me. And now what I want to do is like, accelerate her comfort on an island like she's gonna have to be on her own a little bit and i'm trying to like build this independence of do the right thing when i'm not right next to you as well and when i say the right thing i i do mean what i'm asking you to do i i just think it's like a it's an obedience thing it's a you know i use the word discipline and i don't know that it's a negative like i think discipline is a really positive thing with dogs and i think a lot of people think it negative so i i all i want is you to do the right thing even when I'm not next to you. And my hope is that when we do get into more like actual training in the field and all that stuff, that some of this stuff will be, will be valuable and, and help me through those things down there. Yeah. As long as you, you know, what I like to say is you keep, you can keep that stuff separated and the stuff that you can impact, which is the training Right. And the stuff that she just got to learn, let her do that. And slowly you work them together. I mean, they're just, because right. you can't just take it and help her through all her instinctive stuff. She's got to figure some of that stuff out. I mean, right. like right. you talked about, I know a guy just like that. Well, somewhere between the guy that overhandles and micromanages dog and the guy that's got his dog out of control is the right answer. Yes. Yep. How you get there, there's probably a lot of different ways to get there. You know right. I mean? Right. I'll tell you one other thing I started doing a few years ago. It's kind of interesting. Again, I mean, I'm kind of a different bird dog trainer. Um, 
I, I know actually how people really train dog, other dogs, right? Bird dog training, to be honest with you, there's not a lot of training involved to most of these guys. If they're kennel dogs, right? Right. They come when they call them, and eventually they teach them to, well, otherwise, like in Georgia, we go out in the spring and we turn 10 dogs, not 10, I should say, but six puppies loose on a plantation and just ride and watch, right? And they're hunting and finding birds and bumping them at summer point. Another one comes in back and one might be pointing, another one go rip them out. You just let, you're putting them out in the birds and just let them figure it out. Right. You know, you're not really using the, if you did it right, you don't even need a collar on them much, right? Because it's hot for one thing. And when you get all done, you got water bowls there and they're coming in. Right. I mean, so there's, you don't really need, as far as the bird dog part of it, there's not a lot of training. I'll be the first guy to say, it's like, you're more molding things. I like to look at a bird dog as a dance partner. And because I feel like, and this might be wrong. I mean, I know dogs don't do things for me necessarily, but I mean, I do, I got, I do this, you do that. We're dancing, you know, and we're out here. You got your job. I got my job, but we both have to do them. And yeah, one guy's leading, but he's not ordering. Right. You know, everybody just knows their part and then and you got to let them learn their part. Yeah. You know? I mean, I totally agree. What I used to do with the pigeons, I was get, got off the track there, but when I started, when I started introducing pigeons with these puppies, and this is where I started doing kind of what you're doing, but still I'm using birds. I noticed that when I'd walk out there, when I first introduced birds, they're walking around and I may get a pigeon in my hand, I'll rub it on the grass, you know, yep. and then I'll let them call them over and give them a smell what that is. And then I'll let it go a few feet above their head or probably at arm's length at first. You know, I always like to take things real easy, right? Yep. So they're not startled by it or something and let them see it and throw it out. And then they'll chase it a little bit. Of course, when they're little, they don't chase it very far. Then what I noticed is about every time I did that, when I started, I started, they started cluing in off me going, Hey, when they see me do a certain thing, they started pointing the pigeon in my hand. I mean, there could be five puppies out there and they'll go point that pigeon in my hand. Well, then I, what I started saying is, Whoa, they're already standing there. Right. 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 And then what I started doing was say, whoa. And when I toss the pigeon, I say, all right. Of course, they're going to chase it anyhow, right? Yep. And I had a guy come over one time, and I had six or seven five-month-old pups. So then what I started doing was not showing them the pigeon. I started putting the pigeon behind my thing, and I started – well, first of all, I started holding the pigeon here. I started holding the pigeon up up here, okay? Then once I, got, once I did that, I started holding the pigeon behind my back and just holding my hand up. Well, they'd see that hand up and boom, they could be 40 yards away and five puppies would just point my hand. Yep. Then I started letting the pigeon and I'd say, I'd say, actually say, whoa. And then I'd let that pigeon go and off, they'd chase it, you know, and it got so that if they were out there, I, I didn't want to fool them a bunch, but if I just held my hand up, even without a pigeon, right. they all turned around and pointed me. Right. It was just interesting. I'm not sure that helped me. That helps me in the field in the end. Right. You know? I never necessarily kept it up for a while, but it just shows the go you the different things you can do with them. Right. You know? Exactly. And that's the, that's my thought with it is to build a skill that yeah. they have that is close to what I'm going to do with them out in the field. Yep. Maybe just give, and, and my reasoning for it, don't laugh at me. If I cheat them a little bit early by understanding the idea and not make it so that I have to be as much on them. And I'm not saying it's too much pressure and I'm not, but I'm saying if I can avoid having to turn it up to that level of correction, by instead of starting, you know, starting a little closer to the middle, then the op, then my balance is better instead of up here and down here to come to here. That's my thought with it. And like, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying about the hand, because like one of the things I, I always do it with my dogs and I'm doing it with her because I, I do feel like it's body language. And so yeah, when, I, when I swing out in front of a dog, I always, I'm always doing this it's a traffic cop stop, like stand, don't move. And so what I've started doing, I don't say anything to her yet. I haven't started saying anything to her. I've swung around and I go like this and I just slowly back up. And if she were to creep, I'm, I'm, I move and she responds and, and I'm just, and I'm, I'm trying to do it with no verbal because I think that's pressure. And so I'm, I'm easing my body really. It's really, um, it's very clear to see. I'm trying to be gentle with him. Trying to be. I'm just easing my way back to you. And now I get to her, and now I give her a good, you know. And then she, you know, back to instead of being tense, she's back to oh that I'm wagging my tail, and I go there. She learned something. She knew that's what I want. She understands that's what I wanted. Is my hope. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. and that 
that's all fine. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I think, but what you're going to see is you may say like the dogs are soft around people and stuff, but when birds become around and that excitement level goes up, it's going to be a whole different deal. That's right. why, why I like to work dogs around pigeons. What I say, not pointing them, but around them, right? Yeah. A lot of those, like I said, they're not smelling it because, and it's less, it's less pressure on them when they know one's over there 30 yards right. than right. If they were smelling it, right? So that's what I like to ease sure. off. Right? Yep, right? that makes sense. But, but the other thing is I look at the pigeons like a fun bumper, right? Yeah. So those dogs are out there and my sessions are short and I get a fair amount done in each session, maybe 20 minutes, right? But they'll go out there and have fun and do all that. And the birds, if they get a little bit, like a little bit down a little bit, well, may, I may take over and let them point one and let them chase it a little bit. You know what I mean? Right. And just everything is good, you know? Right. Uh, I mean, I've done all different things. The other thing I've done too, when I'm wool breaking them, like a lot of people don't do, when I teach them to stop and point the bird, and we teach them to stand there with pigeons anyway until you even until the bird flies away, right? Yeah. Shoot the gun, right? A lot of times I'll just, I won't even shoot the gun, I, but... I don't want them chasing the bird anymore. They're at that stage, right? Or they, they, they're not chasing as much, but they're ready to be taken off the chase. So anyhow, I'll let them, they'll point the bird. I'll go flush it. And if they want to move, I'll, I'll have somebody else flushing the bird. I'll hold them with the flank collar. I won't even use it. As soon as they settle down, I give them a toot on the whistle. I say, all right. In other words, I'm telling them now it's okay to chase. So, right. And, and then, so that's a real simple deal, right? And I'll eventually go to the collar and eventually what, what happens is I'll, I'll make them pause a beat before I say, go, oh, it's okay to chase it. And then I'll make them pause two beats and three beats. And by three beats, the pigeon's way over there now. When I say, all right, they don't even chase anymore. They go back to hunting. Right. Where a lot of people, when they start to say, when they start to say, you can't ever chase again, it's, it's like a line, right? You can never chase again. But I don't think, in my mind, that's not fair. You've been chasing and chasing and now you can never chase again. No, let's just work on. Right. Back and off. Exactly. Yes. Right. And that makes, that to me makes a lot of sense. And I feel like that's an incremental thing. Like I, I, yeah, I think that dogs, dogs should always do stuff incrementally and like we should set them up to take those little baby steps as opposed to, I don't think it's, I, I, it comes down to, it sounds silly, but I think this, but it's a fairness thing. Like, I don't think it's fair for a dog to, to have to live by two sets of rules because today you're this old or today I'm going to decide agree. that we're going to this next thing. I think we got to, it's this idea of the end always in, in my front of my mind and realizing I can't get to the end right now, but what are the, what are the 50,000 steps that'll make that end happen and easy, okay. and easy. When I say easy, I mean like, doable from one to the next one to the next yep. one to the next yep. so I, I use that same exact word i don't think it's good to ask a dog it's not fair to ask them to do anything it's like if you ever heard of the wool post and if you yep. looked at the stuff you have yep and that was their big deal they put this dog and i did that for years you put them on a post they run to the end of the rope and it hits their flank and they're spinning and jumping and i thought that's not right 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 that's not fair to the dog he has no idea what he's supposed to do right you no know? so that's like with me. Now, one thing you're going to find about that collar and, you know, is that that flank collar, what really makes a difference is it's one thing to use your hands on the, the dog that's close, but when that dog's 80 yards away, right. And he's pointing the bird when, it, when they're to that stage and they point the bird and either the bird goes or they take it out. Boy, and I'm, I, I don't rarely use that much electricity, right? But now, boom, boom, I can get to them right now. Right. And that's what me, you know, that that's what makes them learn really fast. Right. Most of the time when I'm using that flank collar, it's super low. Now every every now and again you have to step it up. Sure. Right. And and my reasoning with it is not my reasoning to not do it is not because I don't think that that is a, is a sound and and fair way to do things. My reasoning is because quite honestly because I've not used one ever before, I don't know how well my time, I don't know how good my timing would be. And I realized in order to get good, you gotta, you gotta do it. You're going to have to make some mistakes. You gotta, it's just like anything else. Yeah. My problem with it is, is we have what I, what I think is 
in the hands of a really good trainer that knows what they're doing, I don't have issues with it at all. It's, I feel like most of the people that follow our stuff and that's who we're, who I'm influencing and help, yeah. hopefully helping, yep. they are not going to use it. Right. They don't, right. they're not patient enough. Like I was with Todd, I was with Todd today and I, you know, I think, I think a lot of Todd, I think he's a great friend of mine. We hunted over his dog this morning and he's got a collar on his dog and I don't know if he knows how to use it. Like he doesn't know if he's got it charged half the time, but he literally, it, it, Hank ran off, uh, flush. We, we fought, he pointed, flushed a bird. I missed it, but bird flew off and he chased. And so, and I'm sitting there smiling ear to ear because there's a beautiful point. I had my dog on heel. Todd walked in and flushed it. And so I brought my retrievers with the, to flush and, and to sure. retrieve. And it worked out beautifully. A couple of times it was like picture perfect. But then the one time this time I missed, the bird flew off. Hank, Hank broke on it and he's, you know, he's not broken to that yet. So he, he yeah. broke when the bird flushed and he chased it and chased it, chased it. And I'm smiling going, man, that was awesome. That was so cool. And Todd is just livid because he can't get the dog back. And I'm going, well, he's chasing a bird that he just flushed. It was right next to his like I didn't think it was I wasn't um I wasn't turned off by it at all I thought man what a learning moment for the dog learning moment for us learning moment for Todd now this is the first time I've hunted with him since this fall and mm -hmm. and so but and Todd has had some great moments where he's really seen some things accelerated and so Todd's all frustrated Todd's very frustrated at this point and I'm going Todd relax you know I'm, I didn't I'm not saying that to him but I'm thinking in my head relax right. relax and he's just pissed and he says i'm gonna hit him with that collar and when he said that i thought there's the reason now todd is a friend of mine who doesn't use collars on his and i go there's the reason why i don't use a collar because i don't know if i have the the patience or the willingness or the ability to let my frustrations go in that moment and it might be too easy for me to hit that dog with the collar and regret it later and i'm going the only way I can avoid that is not do it. Don't, don't put myself in the position to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with collars when they're used by people that know what they're doing with them. My, my fear is, and my realization of the people that I talk with, most people that have them don't know how to use them and they're using them irresponsibly, I think poorly. And then I think it's not fair. And I go, so I really want to, I really, I know it's going to take me more work. Um, I think it's going to take more work. I think it's probably going to take me more time to get where I want to get. I think it's going to be more challenging and, and there's going to be points that are going to be more frustrating, but I also realize that I also think it's going to really harness me into the idea of, and it's why I'm, why I'm leaning on the idea of create my foundation to be really solid. Like mm -hmm. inst I really want the dog to succeed so if i'm going to put it into a position that could get a little bit dicey i better have a real good connection with the dog like i better have and when i say connection i mean like the ability to recall them in some pretty distracting areas and and but i also then i then i think it's a mindset for me to say you know what when you go out to that opportunity when you're hunting with that dog and the dog moves the bird and it chases it you better just smile and go, you know what? It's part of learning. That dog's going to learn it. And, and I think that's a mindset thing for me that will be, um, it will be forced patience. And, and I, I'm going to have to separate the two. I'm going to have to say in, in the, in the training stuff. Yeah. I have, I probably can have a little bit higher expectations and, and ask a little bit more if I set it up properly. But in the, when it gets to the point where we cross that line of like controlled and uncontrolled, you also have to be ready to be patient enough to say, we're going to get through it. But like you said, the, the dog's going to chase for a phase, then the dog's going to not chase for the phase. So be okay with that instead of jumping the gun of like unrealistic expectations, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think give that a try. I mean, it's sound training principles that you use what she's already doing and keep them separate for a while. Sure. Right. And then sure. by the time you're going to use wool around birds, she'll be well comfortable with it. Right understand it yeah we'll see. I, mean, I don't see any i don't see any problems to do it that way sure sure okay well that i mean it's hearing you explain your process is helpful because like what i think i'm going to do is and this is what i've been doing there's a lot of stuff i've watched videos and and that i just i don't i don't like it i just don't i'm not going to do it that way 
it, I'm not saying it's wrong. And I'm not, and I know these guys train nice dogs. Um, the, in the end, their dogs get where they want them to be. And, and I'm hoping to my, but I, I, I'm going to end up like robbing from everybody. I'm going to steal a little bit of like mm-hmm. this that yeah. I think might work yeah. and that might work. And, and that's just how, how it's probably, I think it's going to be a real hybrid effort, but yeah. uh, that's what I've done over the years, right? You see different people do things and you go, I ain't doing that. And right. Say, well, I kind of like that. You know, the guy I learned that I, I flew out to a guy, they called him the magic man in Arizona years ago. Um, and he trained with birds and a collar and he, and he, and he worked them around birds really young, four or five months old. And he'd have them stand in birds, but he had a, he used a pinch collar and an e collar on the neck at the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, just low level, he would just use nicks, just nick, 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 right. No continuous stuff. And he'd get these little puppies. He wouldn't say a word, right. He would just work the ch- little, he'd just use a 10 foot check cord and a pinch collar and the e collar on there. And he'd start with the pinch and he got these puppies beautiful, real young, without doing, they didn't even know what woe meant yet. But they, with him, the interesting part of that, his theory was the bird means woe, which that's what I've kind of come to. That's why when I use birds all the time, woe is redundant when the bird flies away, when, they're, when they understand it all, because the bird flying away means stand there. That's why, I mean, if you watch me run a dog, people have come out with me and stuff and say, you know, with a three or four or five year old dog, they go, well, you don't do anything. No, I don't need to do anything. They right. know what to do, right. <laughs> you know, right. they hunt with me. They stop when the birds go, they back another dog. They come in when you call them, which I very seldom even call them in unless I mark a bird down or something like that. Or we're, cause when we get done, we're at the truck and they know we're done. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'm not you saying, know, you know what I think when I'm, this is really good for me because what I'm seeing too is, and I need to see more of it probably like you're like, you have such a, you're so comfortable with what you're doing. Your confidence level, is, you know, you've done it. You've done so many. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. I understand why. Mm-hmm. And you, you have faith in your dogs that they're going to do the right thing. You set them up for it. But then like, so I've, we've got this young guy that was at our workshop last year. He brought a setter. Um, it's a real interesting story about this kid. And he was 17 years old and he came with his dad and his dad's buddies. There's some depth to that story too. But he brought this dog, a really nice um, setter. I think, it, I think it was a Llewellyn setter, but it was a very nice dog. And he made some really big moments that weekend. The dog made its first retrieve. I think the dog was about 16 months old. It made its first retrieve. It did. I mean, I, I got pictures of this kid with a smile on his face. Like you wouldn't believe, but I I've messaged with him back and forth throughout the, the year or over the year and asked him how hunting has gone. And he said, I said, his dog's name is King. I said, you, how's King doing? Have you gotten him out? And he said, he messaged me back. He said, we're doing really good in the yard. Um, we made a lot of progress. Things are going good with, you know, a lot of obedience stuff. He was here for an obedience workshop. Sure, yeah. I said, how, how are things in the field? And this was like in October, early October. I expected he had been in the field, you know? And he said, I haven't taken him yet. I'm a little, little concerned. Um, his recall is not great in distracting situations. And I don't know that I can always get him back. And when I want him. And I, I, I talked to Chris Smith because Chris Smith connected with this kid really well too. And so we both said, and so Chris and I were talking about it and Chris, Chris had a dog, Chris's dog was really bold this last fall and he'd really go, you know? And, and so I told Chris, I said, what Sam was his name. I said, what Sam, and I, I called him and I talked to him, but I said, Sam, at some point you put all this work into the training. At some point you have to trust enough and have enough faith in the dog that and, and understand it's not going to be perfect, but yeah. you're going to have to let go in order to let the dog do what the dog needs to do. And if you can't let go, the dog won't ever do it. And, right. and, it, and it's you, you let go way easier than probably I'm going to let go. You know, Sam was having a hard time letting go in the fir- first place. And so like, there's all these levels of comfort and, and trust. And I think faith is the word because for lots of reasons, but faith itself is important in our lives. And when it comes to our dogs, I think it's really important because you have to have that. If you go out there and you go, 
oh shit, the dog's going to run away and I'm going to lose the dog and I'm fearful and all this stuff. It's not going to go. It's not going to happen. It's not right. going to work for you. If you right. go and, and Chris almost was, had so much faith, like I questioned Chris. I said, boy, you really believe in this dog, don't you? Yeah, you know, and so, the, but his, his was, to, you know, maybe a little on the extreme too. And so, but I feel like it's, it takes, you have to release in order to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you'd never release, it won't. And you also can't be so freaking loosey goosey that you have at the will of, I hope the dog does it. You know, you can't just cross your fingers. I think you have to have that balance of preparation for it. And, and then, and then test the waters with it and, and then probably learn from it and realize, you know what we suck. Like Todd did, Todd did some stuff today with Hank that I was like, that was awesome. Like Ben filmed it a lot. You'll see some of it. Cause it was, some of it was really pretty and beautiful and perfect. And then some of it was, I looked at it as I know what I would come home with. I'd come home with the idea of recall with some distractions. I'd work on that. Like not in a bird field, I'd work on it elsewhere. You know, I I'd be working on some of the stuff that created some of the issues, but like all in all, I'd have been, if I were Todd, I'd have been like really, and I think he was very happy at, with a lot of it, but like, I don't know if he was as happy as I think he should have been. Now that's me personally, but I look and I, you know, he's got a lot more experience with his dog, but he was really frustrated at certain things that I feel like after having this conversation with you, if you'd have seen it and been there to tell him that's expected, don't worry about that, Todd. I bet you Todd would go, I feel a lot better about things then because I don't know that I should be worried or concerned or pissed off about what just happened. Right. Right. But we don't have that, you know, and, and, right. and that's where experience will hopefully allow that to happen. But I hear you talk about it just so smoothly. And, but now, it, now it's very dance like for you, yeah. you know, like yeah. that's I mean, part of and, and that's why, you know, part of it, when I say, tell these guys, and really a lot of our guys are really good about it. A lot of them have collars, but, but they never shock the dog. They just use the tone or the, sure. the vibrate. A lot of our guys, I mean, they don't, they really don't train at all. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they don't train. They just go hunt. Yeah. I mean, it's the house dogs, so they got a good rapport with it and they take it for walks and right. they're in its head that way. But I mean, you, when you're letting them learn, like they're young like that, okay. Like when you let them chase and at first, let's say, and you watch how far they chase and that now you're going to learn something about that dog. What I used to tell people is early on, I said, now let your dog do its thing and learn, watch it, see its tendencies. See, has it got a ton of desire and a ton of chase or has it just got not as much chase? Is it comfortable being way away from you very long? Is it not that comfortable? And I don't mean hours, but I'm talking minutes, right? right. Because, because I said, in the end, I've had people say, well, I want them to turn right here at a hundred yards or whatever. And I go, because you might find out that you could spend three years teaching them to turn at a hundred yards, but if you shut your mouth at 115, they would have turned on their own anyhow. Right. 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 I mean, so that's why, I mean, it's, everybody thinks, oh, they're running and chasing and they're maybe some of their point and they're doing all this. And I said, yeah, but not only are they learning, but you're learning a lot about your dog, what its tendencies are. So is it really tough? You know, is it really bold or is it only so, so bold? And so now, you know, when I got to work it around the birds and you get an idea of how to do, I mean, you're learning as much as the dog when you let them just do what they do. Right, right. right? And, if you, and if you're fortunate, I'm fortunate in all areas I've ever been, I'm not in a little city block, okay? I'm, I'm in some country, so, right. and I'm not worried about it. I got a track and collar on them and not that you even really need it that much, but I mean, they could go chase that bird over the hill and I know right where they are. Sure, right? sure. And, and things like that. That's why, I mean, and, I, and I've read a lot of the old books and I've followed a lot of the new school stuff and everything. And I still believe, I mean, there, there was a day when they first started these bird dogs out, right? They let them run free, or, you know, just around a farm, right? For the first year, they didn't, and those, they'd be hunting and finding birds and backing and who knows what they're doing, right? right. But then they would take them in hand because they didn't have collars then and they didn't have, and, it, and most of the techniques were like when they, how they broke horses, right? They didn't make a horse, they broke a horse. Sure. And that's what they did with the dogs. Now this dog, like that's, it's unfair. The dog's been running around doing it, whatever it wants for a whole year. And now you're going to say, no, now here's a bunch of rules. Right. That, right. So we've come a long ways in the bird dog world from that. Now, the upside was that 
you had a dog that knew a lot about birds. And then right. that dog knew where the birds were in the morning and when they were in the evening. Sure. All, I mean, things that, that's why we got it. To get a good bird dog, they got to learn all those things. That's why I say you got to take them where bird dogs are, where birds are, and just let them figure some of this stuff out. Right. My hope is with the bird stuff, and I'm not even think I'm not thinking about it yet. I mean, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not doing it. Yeah. And I'm I'm really so I I've seen I've seen dogs that get, that are game farm dogs that and this is with retrievers too, like they get good at that. It's not that's not hunting, and it's not like it's not. Um, I think it's good for practice. Like it's almost like a drill. Like if you're a basketball team, if you're a basketball team, you can't just run drills. You have to play basketball to get right. good at playing basketball. But in right. order to play basketball, you got to play, do some drills to learn some specific skills. So I look at like learning opportunities, like a pen bird or, a, yeah. I mean, I've got pen birds here. You know, we, I'm raised, so I raised some pheasants and I just let them go. That's my plan this year with, with her okay. is I'm just going to release these pheasants. I don't want them to be living in my pen i don't want them to be living around my house necessarily i'd like them to be a little wild um, yeah. and so i feel like it's going to give me opportunities more more repetitiously locally with more with more frequency as opposed to going to my cabin but i really feel like i'm really excited about the idea of this is all the excuse i need to be at my cabin as much as possible walking right. the woods for grouse right. and woodcock because i really feel like I'll make the excuse that it's the train. That's how I'm a developer. That's how I'm a developer as a bird dog. And it's not even an excuse. That's what it takes. Right. Right. And I, I love the idea of that. And I'm, I'm Chris and I were talking about pen birds and pigeons in, in his, you know, he's got a pigeon coop and he raises some pheasants and Willie walks by it every day and sees it and points at times and points at tweet. You know, he, Chris was really concerned because he's got a bird feeder. In his front yard and every time he comes out Willie goes to the bird feeder and points on Tweety birds and he's like I'm afraid it's going to be an issue for me and I I thought about it and I thought I don't know the answer to that but I feel like I don't he's I, I can't think that that's going to I think that's I got to think it's a phase of his I, I got to feel I feel like but I also feel like if that's an issue well then the certainly the pigeon coop and the pheasants would be an issue and a million people have those so it can't be like no it's not it's it, it's a different context right i mean i've had them where they they aren't interested at all in the pigeons on the coop but go plant one out in the field sure. and it's a whole different deal that's interesting <laughs> i had i just trained a retriever that i could not get to flush my pen pheasants my, my my pheasants that i raised in the pen i couldn't get her excited about it she didn't want it she'd watch them walk across she but you take her hunting in the in the wild she's amazing you know and she's and, and it's a different dog in a different scenario so there's you know that's the answer i needed to hear because like i i think that i do i i think it's interesting that dogs are it's not surprising but like dogs are really more intelligent than i i give them credit for oftentimes and i feel mm -hmm. like they learn pretty, which is why I don't know that you can confident that I can confidently say, and I, I think you, everyone I talk with that's a trainer will agree. If all you do is take the dog to the game farm and they run down these rows or put these piles of Christmas trees with a bird in them, like you don't, you get a, you get a dog that understands that game, but you don't understand You don't have a dog. That's a hunting dog. It's probably my biggest issue with like retriever trials. I think retriever trials are really impressive, but they're not hunting. No, and, no. and you're all, they're all games. They're all games. Even the field trials, all that stuff. You got it. But and the thing, the other thing about game farm birds, and they are useful to you. Like I go to extremes to get birds. Like I told you, I even overwintered two two cubbies of birds this winter, and I got to go out there and snow up to my knees once a week and fill up the feeder and throw some snow in there. But the reason I did that because I knew I was going to have these little puppies. Yep. And these are a cubby already, and when as soon as it, the snow opens up a little, I'll be able to flush them out. I mean never been touched right now of course they smell more right see the diff the big difference i see in game farm birds and i've seen lots of dogs that are really good game farm birds even like quail and you take them out on wild quail because a wild bird has so less scent yeah and i go these these dogs that are working on these put out birds 
A, the scent is mixed. If a guy planted them, there's human scent on them. There's sure. it's not pure scent. And they're in a pen with all these other birds and they're walking in their feces, right? And they got a lot of scent. But a, a wild bird dog, he can't look for a bucket of scent. He's got to look for a thimble of scent. Right, right. right? And that's what the big thing I see with, with that. That's why I don't spend much time on that. But I, I tell people, if you got a good situation, you know, it's, a, it's good to do. You know, as you said, as either an introduction or an occasional thing for what I call something technical. Like yeah. if you're steadying your dog up, right. better to get them steadied on a, on a plant of bird before you move to a wild bird. Right. 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 And that's okay. But to, to just go and go and go and get this, I got a great, you know, game farm dog. If you're a wild bird hunter, it's, right. it's a detriment. And then he's used to just not using his nose because the scent just overwhelms him. Right. So... Yeah, I think it's a drill. I mean, I, I feel like yeah, you gotta yeah. use it as a drill. And so, yeah. but that that is, and so I I feel better. Like I, I, I these are good, these are good conversations for me for mm -hmm. lots of reasons, but the this the simplicity of it, I can see in how you describe stuff similar to how I feel about a lot of retriever stuff. Like it's not simplify it keep it pretty simple use what the dog has for you i think it's i do think it's magnified with a bird dog like i think it's it is such a natural thing and it is such a um you, you almost have to get out of their way at times of 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 yeah. of not yeah. creating an issue you know and i'm gonna have to that's gonna be hard for me because i'm a i'm not a micromanager with a dog i prefer retrievers to work naturally like i i like them to handle but I want to handle yeah. them to an area and then let them hunt. I don't want to, I don't want a dog looking to me for, do I need to go three yards to the right? Do I, should I go back? I don't, I want them to make decisions that are, they're better at it than I am, you know? Right. So I want them, but I also think it's, I need to work with you. You know, I don't want a dog that just wants to work and do his own thing either. So I, I don't want to, I got to get in the middle of that too. So this is, this will be a, um, a good thing for me to to it's really going to have to it's going to challenge me to put faith into the dog probably younger earlier more of and and i think they're going to earn that though i i do and, I, and she's already and that's why i say like she's already earned she's won me she won me over very early but for lots of reasons but she's also like she's quicker through stuff and so by her getting quicker through stuff my confidence grows with her. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have to help her much because I feel like, you know, she'll, she gets through it. She figures out how to get through it. And that's mm -hmm. where, um, it, you know, it's just going to make me a better, it's going to make me look at things differently and I, it'll be better in the big mm -hmm. picture for me too. So. Mm -hmm. It's funny you say that because one thing I do, this is why I use pigeons and things like that is like, and my train set, my, I, I train the dogs faster now than I ever have, right? When the timing is right, sure. right? Because I also think that it makes a huge difference to the dog because I look back now at some of these, and still these guys, it's like the dog gets it, but it knows you can't enforce it, right? Sure. So you can, they may, I think, I mean, a dog can open a gate, you know this, one time, yep. right? They, I've seen them learn a lot of shit one time and never forget it. Right. So I go, I know they can learn fast. That's why I use the birds as a motivator and I use the collar and, and I could just move them through it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of these people talk about all these repetition, repetition, repetition. And they, that's why these old timers used to say, you got to kill birds for the dogs. Yeah, because they put so much pressure on them that you had to kill the birds to keep, you know, to keep the dog's motivation up, you know? Right. Right. And it's like, no, you just move through it a lot faster. So if you, if you know what to look for and your timing's good, right? You can move. I mean, it really doesn't take them that long. You, you'll you know when you, you'll say, well, we're just standing there in a few times. She'll figure that out. I mean, she might not do it, but I'll guarantee you she probably knows it. Sure. Sure. Right. That's what I've learned with dogs is they know shit way sooner yep. than we realize. Right. You know, it's just being able to understand because it's like correcting a dog. You know, you don't want to correct the dog that doesn't know what he want, what it's supposed to do. But if he does know, you want to correct him. Right. right. And I don't mean, again, when I say correction, my corrections aren't, oh, you son of a bitch. My, right. my corrections are, no, that's not what I wanted. Right, right. right. Yeah, she's, right. she's, one of the things that 
stuck out to me was the other night, like she's, she's a hell of a retriever. I mean, she retrieves great. She went through a little bit of an issue. She didn't want to retrieve at all. We did a few things. I literally, I used food. I never used food for retrieving. I didn't use it to give her a reward to bring it back. I, I took food. She didn't, she wouldn't chase a dummy. Like she wouldn't chase a balled up sock. She wouldn't, she just wasn't interested in it early on. And I ended up one day, my Lillian took a piece of her food and threw it across the hall, the kitchen. And she saw that and she ran out to it and jumped on it. Like a retriever would re- pick a dummy up. Yeah. And, it, and I watched it and I went, she looked like a retriever just now that, that tripped her. She, that got her going. And so, and food isn't her big thing. Like I couldn't get her to eat very quickly, but she loved right. the game. And so yeah. I told Lily, I said, do that again. So she took a little piece of food and she threw it and the dog ran and jumped on it and got it and turned around and came running back and like, do this again. And so yeah. I sat down for three nights in a row and with, with my daughter, a couple of the days, and I take a bowl of food. It was feeding time. Yeah. And I sat, sat on the ground and I'd roll a bowl of, roll a piece of kibble across the floor and she'd chase it down, grab it, turn around, come back to me, want to do it again. So we did it. We, we would do it. And then I'd get tricky with her and I'd, I'd get a couple pieces of food out there. And then I'd take my hand and I'd pretend I threw it and she'd look and she'd listen for it and she didn't hear it. And I said, go get it. And she'd run out, search with her nose, find it, turn around and come running back to me for, you know, praise. And, and I never, I, I did give her kibble a couple of times when she'd come back, like she'd go out and get it. Then she'd come back and I get it. Yeah. And then I, then it would just be go out and get it and then come back and I'll praise you and I'll do it again. And so we did it for a couple of days with food. And then I, then I took a puppy dummy and I sat down and I pitched the puppy dummy and she went with the exact same enthusiasm for that puppy dummy that she did the food. She scooped it up. She turned around and she came running back into me and launched herself into my lap and wanted to do it again. And she's like, it hasn't, she hasn't missed a beat since. And she, she loves it. And I, and I, so I do it very sparingly. We did it. I bet you I've retrieved with her the most is probably three times in a week. And I, I make three or four retrieves, five, maybe, but like, she just loves it. So the other, so she likes picking shit up now. Well, she comes into the house and she comes in and runs around and my daughter is notorious for taking her socks off always right away. So there's socks on the ground. Well, the puppy picks up the sock. The puppy wants to run off with it. And I don't want that. So I try to encourage her to come back with it. Can't get her to come back. Can't get her to come back. I go over, I take it from her. The other day she went to run towards it. And when she ran towards that sock, I said, no, 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 no. And it literally stopped her on a dime. And she, she just froze. And I went and picked the sock up and I took it you know praised her or whatever well that's when i thought you know i wasn't i was thinking not to use the word no because i was afraid no and woe were too close and then i thought you know what no means stop like when i use no it's usually when i want her to stop doing something and so the idea of no and woe all of a sudden we're like well they're pretty damn close to each other and the actions aren't that far apart i don't want the woe to be negative i don't want to turn her off of stuff but like no act no was a effective thing to stop her from picking that sock up and turning it into a game of chase. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, huh, it's kind of interesting. So, but the retrieve in that dog is beautiful inside outside. Yeah. I went, I got a little aggressive. I went outside. I went, I, you know, my incremental step is go to the porch and I got a, like a porch that right. can't kind of get off of while well, she got off. And then it was, a, you know, a circus. We're not, I'm not getting that dummy back. So It was, you know, we're not ready to go to that big open space yet, but when it's controlled, it's so down and back in the, 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 she's very, she's holding very naturally. And I'm encouraging the hold. I'm taking the dummy from her and giving it back to her and sharing it back and forth. Mm -hmm. And she's really like, I'm going, I think I'm going to have a, so far, everything I've seen is a very natural hold and a very natural delivery. And I, I love it. I think it's great. I think, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you wonder, you know, are you going to get it with this? Are you going to get it with this dog or not? And Todd and Chris are going through their own little journeys of it, but I don't know that my hope is that some of these things that I'm doing today and, and will be doing now I've stopped retrieving with her because she started teething. So I don't, I don't retrieve when they're teething. I just sore on their mouth and whatever. I don't want to form a bad habit, but I feel like the, the effort I'm putting in today with hold 
I hope is going to pay off when it comes to when we start making, you know, more formal retrieves later on down the road. And, and that's the, that's the same idea or concept of end in mind in the beginning. And can I start to shape some of these things mm -hmm. that are, that I'm going to ask of her. I'm not really going to ask that much of her. I'm going to ask her to stop. I'm going to ask her to retrieve it. You know, and, and quite honestly, the retrieve is not nearly as important to me, but it's fun. You know, if she's willing yeah, to do yeah. it. Do yeah. It. Yeah. Retrieve. That, so, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but it's, it's, um, so it's, it's just, it's been cool. It's been fun. It's, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to like, as this thing continues, I'm really looking forward to the weather, obviously getting better too, but um, I appreciate you hearing me out on all this. Cause just, just these, this is a conversation that really brings value to me. It's reassuring of some things and it's probably going to shift my my approach a little bit at, on some things too, but nothing super dramatic. And I feel like that's the, that's where I got to stay is I don't want to get into this, go this direction because this person told me this, go that direction because that person told me this. I feel like that herky jerky movement is. Yeah, no, I agree. It's just not smooth. No, it's interesting to hear somebody else's perspective too, because there's a lot of different ways I think to get the same place. But on, on the other hand, I also feel like being a collector of these, there's a reason I bought all these old dog books wherever I could find them and got a big library because I was always interested. I got them from way back, you know, in the in you know in the UK and stuff before, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, and there's you, even then you found the differences, right? You found right. the people that really wanted to control the dog and the people that really. But I just maybe it was me. You know, I was a falconer for a lot of years, right? Sure. And you didn't control a hawk, you know. Right. You hunt with them, right? Right. I mean, really, you hunted with them. I mean, I, you know, that was, and so I've always felt more with the dogs like that, like we're going to hunt together, you know, and yeah, I'm going to control certain aspects of it, you know. Sure. I mean, I certainly, when I was doing field trials and stuff, you got to take it a lot further than that. But for me, just to go hunting with them, you got a job to do, I got a job to do, well, let's figure out how we can do this together and let's have a good time at it. Right. You know? Right. Right. And that's that's the way I view it. You know, not, so I'm very different from a lot of guys and I'm not that hard on dogs. I've, like I said, I've tried every method and everything that ever came out, you know, not for a while now. I've kind of come into this. Yeah. You know, what I was going to tell you is when I, one thing I forgot was when I went to that guy with, and he used the pinch collar and the short rope and everything and the collar on the neck and I watched him. And this was, I was using the collar on the flank and I'd read his method and I was using it a little bit, but I watched him and I thought, and he was of the old school, right? Of just, he wasn't going to put a collar on the dog's flank, but I watched him and I thought, I love what he's doing, but I can tell you this, it'd be much better on the flank. Sure. And that's when I started using it, you know, going to that. I had used the flank before following the Smith methods and stuff like that. And, um, but so that's what I'm saying. I watched what he did and yet, and I took a good share of what he did, but I thought this works, would work better this way. He just not change it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. When he, you know, when he did it, the collars were hot, they were big, and now they're small and they're variable. Yeah. And they're so much more of a tool now. Sure. They're, I look at an e-collar anymore almost as used correctly as a communication device, not really because you can tone them or buzz them sure. or, or stimulate them. Right. 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 And once a lot of them, like a lot of our guys and stuff, what I like about them is too, is I'll use that, I'll condition the tone for a recall, right? So, now I got to say one less thing. Right. right. So I'm out there and they're way over there. I mean, one thing my dogs learn too is when I stop and stand still and they're way out there, it's body language. Hey, come and check me out. Right. right. But if they don't, if they can't see me and I tone them a little, I tone them. I mean, they'll just, they don't run to me like they're going to come and knock me over, but they work their way back toward me. Sure. You know I mean? So now I don't even have to say that. Right. Right. You know, I mean, all that, like you said, there's so much verbal is the least efficient way to communicate with a dog. Right. Really is, especially when they're trying to do a job. I mean, I think that you're distracting them, you know, right. with voice commands, right? It's almost like what I, when pe people have a dog making game and they're going, easy, whoa, easy, careful now. And I'm thinking of a guy, you know, diffusing a bomb, you know, some intricate thing. And the guy's back there saying, hey, make sure, oh, be careful. You know, you right. don't want to. Right. But there's a lot of different ways they can do it. I mean, they still, they always point the bird, right. but some will point them way back, some will point them close. Some will move around them a little bit when they point and yet still keep them on the ground. I mean, it, it's amazing. Right. right. I'm not 
there's no, I mean, I know there's a classic way, right? Yeah. But some of these dogs will learn to circle, you know, running birds, right? Where, I mean, I've seen it and I don't know if you heard of that or not, but I mean, I've seen dogs that point a covey. I've seen it in Texas, mostly on quail because there's, you know, they get, there's a lot of birds in quail, right? right? Where the dog would point and when you get up there, he's on a point like, like and, but he knows those birds are running and he will back up a little bit, make a big old circle and get way up wind of them, turn around and point back toward you like he's got a nose full of scent. And he knows the birds are between you and him now. Sure. And you can't, you can't teach him that. Right, right. And I'm sure I've seen people where they put a bird in a long tube and they try to teach them to do things like that. And maybe you can, but. Right. It, even if you taught them to do it on a tube, again, I mean, it's, to make that, then to have them figure that out on a different bird in a while, I don't know. But right. I mean, they're so smart. It's like in the old days. They had dogs called reporters and they'd be, this is when they only had a bell and maybe even before they used bells, the dog would go out and point and find a grouse. And after a little bit, it's like you it knew you couldn't find it. It would back up, come back out. And I've heard this from two or three different guys. And I've also read about it. But as soon as the dog, as soon as the dog came and saw you and you looked and saw it, it would turn around and go like, let's go this way. Sure. And it would, and it would go all the way back to where that bird is and maybe even moved a little and pointed again and now you're with them right so, i mean they figured this out and that's dogs that they're none of that was trained right they right. knew they figured it out you know i right. mean that's kind of the cool part of it totally you know? yeah that's really interesting i mean i i think and and that is why i think it's important to talk to you when it comes to the questions that i'm going to have specifically on this dog because i do think that there's something to be said about multiple generations of stuff that you're looking for and what you're, how you're building your line. And, and there it's, it fits, it fits. And, and, and the reason I say that is because I, that's what I'm doing with some of our labs. Like there are certain dogs that there are certain dogs that I feel are the best fit for me and the way I'm going to train them. And so I'm trying to repeat it and I'm trying to make it as consistent as possible so that it meshes in, in jives. So for me, I think you're the value of being able to get feedback from you on, on your dogs is the most valuable source of information I have. So I'm probably going to bug you. Uh, that, no, that's fine. I, I get, I get stuff out of the conversation too. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, and I, and that's, that's the thing too. I just enjoy the, that part of it yeah. because there's, yeah. there's a lot to be gained as well from that. So um, I know I took a ton of your time here this afternoon, so I appreciate what you okay. yeah. want us to do it.